Thank you, Calvin, uh, for this warm introduction. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Brian Lin. I'm an assistant research scientist in Umtree's Human Factors Group. And um, thanks, um, CCAT, for sponsoring this project. This is a very good opportunity for us to you know, investigate this important topic. So try to think about, you know, when how, most of us are drivers today. So we drive almost every day and try to imagine when you're a driver, um, how many times you blame the bicyclist, what they're doing. And also, when you ride a bike on the road, how many times you also blame the driver, what are you doing? So in today's presentation, we just like to, you know, um, walk through some important factors to see what are the, um, what are the, the critical factors that could influence um, how the vehicle overtake the bicyclist. So, you know, we focus on the different perspectives for the drivers and the bicyclists to see how much difference in between and how we're going to adjust if we're going to develop the automated um, vehicle to overtake bicyclists, what we should pay attention to. So first I'd like to, um, the next slide, there we go. So first I'd like to uh, appreciate my team for, um, uh, you know, support this entire work. Dr. Shen Bao is my um, co-PI of this project. And in this team, we have postdocs, students, and also um, the industry um, pr industry principal from Toyota, the Collaboration Safety Research Center. So about this, uh, before we start the presentation today, let me give you some background and importance about why we're like to, um, you know, investigate this important topic. So based on, you know, the forest, uh, forest data, in 2020, about like 30% of the fatal crashes with the bicycle involved were observed as motorists overtake bicyclists. So they're kind of like, uh, it's actually, it's 30%, but it's, it's kind of like dominate the other kinds of uh, reasons of the fatal crashes or the scenarios when, the, um, when you're riding bicycles on the road. And also in the state of Michigan, if you remember, like five years ago, the state passed a law that's all the vehicle, when you overtake the bicycle, you, uh, it's required that you stay away from that bike for at least three feet. So it doesn't matter what the road geometry, what the lane boundary looks like, what the lane width looks like, you have to remain that distance, lateral distance to the bike. So how many, how many people, how many drivers follow that rules? I don't know. I'm not, that's not part of the uh, scope of this study, but we like to know if, if this is going to be the factor you care about when you overtake the, the, um, the bicycle list and also when you're overtaken by a vehicle. So, and also from the previous study, when a dedicated, dedicated bike lane was present, um, driver made last lateral maneuver. So they would try to, you know, since bikes stay in his own lane, so I don't need to move that far to get rid of, you know, to, to stay away of that. And also when there's a oncoming traffic on the left and the overtaking will be, um, have like a smaller distance. Um, you know, across the, the boundary. So it's kind of like a trade-off. If there's a bike and there's a common traffic, how far you have to stay away for each party? You know, like there's a, you stay um, longer distance to the, to the, uh, to the bicyclist, which means you stay closer to that oncoming traffic. So there's kind of, you know, um, we just like to see as the, as the driver, you care about bicyclists, you care about oncoming traffic or both, how much in between. And the bicyclists, you know, usually they will expect that the vehicle should stay uh, with a larger clearance when they overtake. But driver usually over, you know, overestimate um, the distance when they overtake. I thought I stay long enough, but actually you're not. So in this uh, presentation today, we tried to, we first tried to develop the computational model since we focus on automated overtaking feature. So we create the um, computational automated overtaking model um, using the naturalistic data management by, um, managed by the University of Michigan Transmission Research Institute. And so we like to, from that model, we like to understand when will the drivers start to initiate um, an overtaking and like how far would have, um, the driver cross the lane boundary with what speed. So they kind of like a, in, elaborate in tri, uh, the entire trajectory and the story of this um, overtaking process. And also we'll, then we'll try to implement that models to an automated uh, overtaking feature in the environment of a driving simulation. 
So in that simulation environment, we will try to evaluate from the driver's and bicyclist's perspectives and to understand, okay, what's the difference in between from your perspectives? And also, what are the critical factors each of you care about? So these are the tasks that kind of like overlap with uh, what I just mentioned. So uh, we'll walk through those tasks. And, um, but again, um, besides investigating the factors with the impact on um, their subjective assessment, we also like to see if there is a change, there is any changes or adjustment we need to make from the result and back to the overtaking models we developed from the computational data. So let's talk about the first task um, to how would we model the human human driver overtaking behavior. So, and. From Umtree's um, naturalistic database, we own um, the data set like you know, collected by more than um, 100 vehicles that that shows, you know, um, that's been exposed on the road for between like half a year to a year and a half. So um, here, here are the independent variables we like to look at uh, from for this model first for the, for the environmental factors, um, such as, you know, the lane geometry, the lane width or so. And then we also like to um, consider if there is some coming traffic or not. So, and there is, if there is a dedicated lane. So like, since um, so geometry, uh, well, I'll say the situations with the coming traffic and the, present, the presence of the dedicated, dedicated lane, bike lane is very different in between. So we try to separate them into different models and so basically, totally um, from the naturalistic data we collected, um, totally we have like 1,500 and 15 overtaking events. So we try to separate them into these four cells um, by manipulating the design of a bike lane and the uh, oncoming traffic or not. And then, yes. They like all at one spot? Yes, all different places. So kind of like. Um, all of like a southeastern Michigan. How many? Oh, um, I'll say like it's more than that's hundred thousands of miles of driven miles. So they're kind of everywhere. So <laughs> yeah, but I can say most of the um, the mileage occurred in um, southeastern Michigan. Mm -hmm. And then for those um, using those independent variables, we tried to. Um, we try to predict if the driver will start when the driver will start to initiate that lane change. So the predictors we selected include how fast the vehicle is driving, um, the gap between the vehicle and the bike, and the route, relative speed between the vehicle and the bike, and the position, um, like relative position to the uh, left boundary. So the um, you know the far the the closer you stay with the left boundary, that's um, pretty much you may want to, you may just stay drive, driving straight since like you have some clearance with the bike. So here it says just quickly, um, look at this, um, the model. So this is just one example since we remember we have four different models. This is just one of them. So we have the, like, um, the model is for no oncoming traffic with a shared bike lane. And we found that the gap. The longitudinal gap and the relative speed are the two, you know, important factors um, or significant factors in this model. So based on this model, that can help us to predict, okay, the overtaking probability, once it's past the threshold, that's the model, well, should suggest the vehicle to engage the overtaking. So actually, um, in other words, the model will be, the overtaking will be triggered by, you know, detecting the gap in between and the relative speed between the car and the vehicle. Once that's, you know, the outcome, the overtaking probability um, after the calculation past the threshold, uh, the model should suggest the vehicle to, to start that overtaking. So that's just kind of a simple um, rule for how this model works. And then that's based on the logistic regression. And then the second task, the next task is that how we're going to uh, how we implement that models into a simulation environment. So we did that in the Umtree um, driving simulator. And um, 
that simulator right now is not fully functioned, but we take advantage from uh, the hardware um, and the space and the layout we have from that from that uh, simulator room. So here's some kind of like a sketch you can see from the left. Um, so we have three projections for both um, perspectives. As the bicyclist, we just focus, you know, since when you're being overtaken, you care about the, the you know, the, the scenes from your lab. So we just, um, we just, um, you know, use that three projections to simulate the, the scene you see from the lab, which is the picture you see on the top. And then this one that's kind of, yeah, we have the bike facing towards the, the middle of the, uh, the dedicated bike lane. And this, in uh, this picture, it shows like a vehicle just overtake that. So, you know, it's like, it's, it's a double, um, yellow line, yellow solid line in, um, the center of the road, but because you have to stay clear to, you know, with the bike. So sometimes you need to cross the boundary. And in this case, there is no oncoming traffic, but in our, um, the other, um, you know, the setting, the other settings or scenarios in our experiments, um, that we do have the, um, the, the oncoming traffic. And from the driver's perspective, um, we have the participants stay in the cab. So basically in, in this experiment, um, the cab and the bike stay stationary. So we just try to simulate that and, um, but the, you know, the scene of the, the forest scene and, and the side scene will, um, will, will, will. So we can, I can show you some videos after that. And this is kind of like a spec of this, using the sketch for the setup in the simulator room. So based on, you know, what we just mentioned in our, our, our computational models that provides you, um, the trigger of this automated overtaking. And then when, you know, that this is the mechanism, how we do that in the simulation. So was the overtaking initiated? Well, was the probability exceeds the threshold calculated by the gap and the relative speed, the vehicle will start to do the overtake. And then, um, you know, we assume that the vehicle will just stay in the center of the lane. And so it has some distance in between with a bike. And, um, so what we need to decide is how far this vehicle should move laterally, um, to either cross the lane, tr cross the center line or not. So this, we just focused on, on the overtaking from the lab. We don't look at the other, um, cases. So this is the video, um, from the driver's perspective. So uh, the driver is in the cab and I'll try to play, I'll play the video that the driver is trying to overtake a bike. You may see a bike at, in the dedica dedicated lane on the far right. So I just play it. Whoops. So, so the vehicle was actually crossed the lane mark for a bit. And then um, after that, return to the original lane. Then you can see the bike staying the. So actually, in this simulation, the trigger of, as I said, the trigger of the overtaking uh, was determined by the computational model we developed. And then in the very end, we'll see are those factors really what the you know the participants care about from both the driver and the bicyclist, and how we're going to determine if those factors are really removed for the automated lane change. Uh, automated overtaking feature. And so you may be able to tell that's, well, that's like this one, the speed is about 40 miles per hour in the rural area. So, but the bike is, it's not going to be speed, the bike ride. So let's see in the, let's see the other video, which is from the bike's perspective. They are, they are actually the same scenario, but you can see the difference in between. So the bike ride about like, uh, about 10 miles per hour and has been overtaken by the car. And so 
this is what, you know, the goal of this study we have, uh, I'll show you in the de design of experiments, but as you can see, same scenario from the driver's perspective and the bike's bicyclist perspective, they look very different. Okay, um, any questions so far? Yes. The road design, in, um, even around here in Long Arbor, the road design for bikes are quite different. And when you're in your experiment, did you look at like different types of road design and how that was for the driver um, and the human driver? Right. So, well, in this experiment, it's like uh, we have many factors to, to consider. So right now we focus on the, the presence of the bike lane or not. Okay. And um, so we did not, I, well, we know like for the dedicated bike lane, it can be protected, protected or not. And this one, in this study, we just um, like it, it's not protected. Okay. Yeah. And, but that's, I think that's a good point. Like, you know, if we want to see that to be more um, applicable and practical to the world, and then we should look at We're different geography. In America. Yeah. It's just, right. <laughs> like a global, global protected bike lane or various different design. And so, at, you know, looking at the, what your scenario was, was like, a two ring highway, I mean, a one ring highway on each side. Right. And then, or, or, you know, a little bike lane, like maybe in a ditch. And I'm on the bicycle is in the ditch, child too. Oh, uh, right. Bike, bicycle. And then this, this little lane where the car has no, no choice. And that's the propeller rate, right? Right. Yeah. So in this study, we, uh, the spec we selected was that about 3.5 meters for the lane width. And the bike lane width was about 1.5 meter. One more. Your data did the, I'm thinking about the city of Albert and the bike lanes here. The main thing was low speed road with bike long I wasn't just 20 miles an hour. But you also also a like a mile an hour. But. Um, so, well, yeah, I got to repeat the questions. <laughs> Online audience can hear. So, uh, we're like, the question is, do we care, do we consider like a lower speed, um, scenario? So yes. So in our design of experiments, um, I can, but I can tell you now, like we consider the speed of the vehicle, uh, 40 miles per hour and 25 miles per hour. And, but the, for the bike, we try to stay as a constant speed, which is like 10 miles per hour. Okay. So, uh, let's keep going then, um. So the next task is how, you know, after we have, um, the computational models, and then we have implemented that to our, um, simulator, then the next one is how we're going to design the entire experiment and, you know, to include the human subjects to participate. So this is the general, um, overview of the design of experiments. So totally we have 16 scenarios. So as you can see, um, there are four areas based on the manipulation of the oncoming traffic or the, uh, the bike lane design. And the other two factors we added was that the target speed of the, um, on the vehicle, which is how fast the vehicle will overtake, uh, will drive to overtake that bike. And then the lateral offset. So the lateral offset data was collected, um, and we you know was calculated based on like different percentiles from the naturalistic data we have. So for example, if you look at the first row, um, our target speed was about is 25 miles per hour. And from our, uh, naturalistic data set, it shows that in the, you know, um, when overtaking the bike in the, um, riding the share lane without oncoming traffic or a mean driver, they stay um, you know, they have the lateral offset from the center of the lane about two meters and 2.14 meters, um, towards the left. So, which means on average, the driver across the lane boundary says half of the width of the lane boundary was about 1.7, 1.8 meters. So 2.14 is, has already beyond that. And, but like, we also look at the. 75th percentile, which is the, uh, more aggressive, they stayed a bit closer to the bicyclist. So the number shows like 1.83 meters. So it's almost like, you know, you have the center of the car 
almost stay on top of the center center lane boundary. And but you have less room to um, the bike. So the same strategy we calculate the different percentiles of the lateral offsets to different situations. So this is kind of uh, the 16 scenarios we have the uh, participant to experience. But again, our goal is to look at, you know, you know, to compare the difference between the driver's perspective and the bicyclist's pers perspective. So what we do was that only we have 32 subjects um, equally distributed in male and female. And we don't want to. Well, okay. They're best. Okay. Oh, those are the number of events we have. So totally, uh, it's 1,515 overtaking events and distributed into these four situations. Okay, so for we recruited this many subjects and equally distributed in male and female. And yes, anyone with disability. Uh, the question is: Is anyone with the disabilities? Answer is no. And we just tried to. Well, we have the, um, but we have them to you know same numbers of male and female subjects. But we don't want to further assign their to them to age groups since we believe. Um, people at any age group will drive and ride a bike. So we try to make it balanced. If we can have, you know, have the subjects across all the ages within this range, that will be perfect. So I can show you the distribution of the subjects um, of the age um, we, we recruited for this study. And, and again, as I mentioned, we have 16 scenarios. So our goal is that for each subject, we want them to experience those 16 scenarios from the driver's perspective, as well as from the bicyclist's perspective. So totally there are 32 scenarios, but they're kind of like a repeat. Well, you know, we repeat those 16 to um, after they finish the driver, and then they were going to experience, they were experiencing those 16 as the, as, the, as the bicyclist and vice versa. And we randomize the scenario orders. So they couldn't tell um, what they just experienced, like if there's same or the different as they just experienced. And also, like I show you in the video, even the same scenarios from the bike bicyclist's perspective looks very different to the driver's perspective. So there is no issue that we show them the same scenario. And that's also the goal of this study with the same scenario. Do we get the same answer from the different perspectives? And we also um, collected some survey, their demographic data, their uh, driving, biking experience, how many hours they, they drive their bike per, per week. And uh, part of their um, behavior questions, question there is like more, it's more like the higher scores they have for their behavior question from their behavior questionnaires, uh, the more aggressive or more riskier, you know, the riskier drivers they are. So we try to consider that, uh, you know, as their, their background. Yes, that's true. Data, what I've what heard is, did you ask about body type or whatever, how they self-identified, whatever, large, small, whatever, physical fitness, socioeconomic data for race or any of those things? Um, no, as I remember, what the question is to, for the, what we consider in the demographic data. Um, so we focus, well, we have age, um, we have age, gender, and there, we don't have the race, I don't believe. And, um, and then I think mostly age and gender. And then we just, then we focus more on the, uh, their driving experience, driving and biking experience and, or exposures to different, um, types of, you know, rural, rural or urban areas. So this is the process that each um, participant will will ex experience. So this, as I said, they will either from start with the driver's perspective scenarios or the bicyclist's perspective scenarios. So we'll just swap them. Half of the subject will start with, as a driver, the other half start as the bicyclist. So we will, ha well, 
once we decide if they need to start as a driver or a bicyclist, they will start to experience the overtaking scenarios one after one. And after each scenario, which is just like the video I show you, um, being overtaken or overtaking somebody, they will need to complete an after scenario um, questions to we collect their subjective ratings from there. Which means, um, from the driver's perspective, we have 16 sets of scenario ratings. From the bicyclist, we have another 16 sets of scenario uh, ratings. So once they finish all the scenarios, they go to the other perspective. And then after they complete all the 32 subjective rating um, question sets, they will need to complete the post that questions questionnaires. So this the post that is more like an overall. So it's not you know specifically for a single scenario, but to be an overall that we want to validate what we collected um, from the from after each scenario is valid or not. Hey, um, this is some, some question I don't know if I should address to. At what? Um, should I click on the Q and A or what? Okay, I'll just keep going. I'll realize I need to do that. Okay, so in this plot, those are the questions we try to pose to the um, participants after each scenario. So we have the questions for drivers, the questions for bicyclists. And most of them look the same, we're just like from different perspectives. And as, and but like for the bicyclist, since we manipulate the vehicle speed, but we did not manipulate the bicycle speed. So we just ask the bicyclist, do you think the driver drive too fast? But we don't ask the same question to the driver. There's, there's no change of the speed from the bicyclist. But you can see some of the questions have some overlapping. For example, um, the first three questions looks about something about satisfaction or how they feel um, about, you know, how that the function works. So we will do some further um, like factor analysis, but I'll show you afterwards. Um, maybe I missed that part, but I have a question regarding the simulation scenario that you created. So in the text form, I believe you need to utilize the naturalist data and data model to predict like to, to pre predict the prob probability that we will overtake. Yeah, to start the overtaking. It will determine when it will overtake. Yeah. Okay, so that's why in different scenario and with different speed, while well, the distance that the car will we should over to. That's correct. Um, the, yeah. So all the like the overtaking initiation timing will be determined by the model. So when we, we manipulate, like that, like I said, um, in the models, only the longitudinal gap. And the lateral and the uh, relative speed matter. So we manipulate those in the model. But besides those, we also manipulate those when you see in the design of experiments, like how far you should go, you know, um, laterally to cross the lane boundary or stay away from the bike. So that makes the scenario, you know, every scenario looks a bit different. And some of the driver, well, some of the participants, they can tell the difference, some just don't. But we just, that's, it is what it is, you know, we just like to see over the, those minor changes, if they can, what, what their ratings looks like, you know, what their assessment um, will help us to determine the overtaking models works. And then um, these are the after scenario ratings. And besides that, we have the post-task questions. Um, so these are more like, a, have some overlap with the after after scenario questions that we want to um, make sure, for example, um, want to look at if their oncoming um, traffic, if, if, if there's going to be, you know, some, um, you know, the critical factors in their mind. If we find the same, if we find this results from the after scenario questions, is that true? Do we find the same results from the post scenarios? You know, even they don't experience those 
um, every single scenarios, but in their mind, what what's, are those um, conclusions stand? So, but I don't want to, we don't need to walk through that, but uh, for the more detail, you can read our report um, through the CCAT website. And so, you know, after conducting the design of experiments, then next one, you know, what I'll show you how, you know, what we in interpret from the data uh, after the analysis. So this is um, the, some data we'll, we'll see from the demo, you know, from the, the quest like survey we did in the very beginning of the study. That's, um, as you can see, the age of the subject is kind of like, uh, you know, not perfectly, but kind of like a more balanced, different, different, you know, among different groups that you can see, well, we still have more subjects from, you know, as the younger group, but like, um, for the like thirties from the, uh, 75, this looks very, very balanced. And we have like only one subject who is like a team. And we also collected, you know, um, how many miles and most of the drivers, they, um, they drive more, more how like, a, you know, this is mileage that we collected. Did you look at their tribal education or what, how long will and drag will? Um, yeah. And the reason I ask this is that, um, most states don't teach driver ed anymore. Like they, 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 that's not a, like years ago. People used to get their driver's license at 16 years old. And then there was like a prescribed way people got driver's education. And nowadays people, you know, that are younger, uh, and if that would say even not so much younger, because that would say anybody uh, that was, tr that was going to high school after 1990 really doesn't have a formal driver. And, and then sometimes they don't arrive as regular. So they're still based to be able to do all the insulin workers. So is there any way that your, your study looks into like, um, their kind of driving for Alice? Yeah. Well, so the question is, do we, in this study, do we look at, um, their driving like a experience for edu education prior to attending this, um, this study? So well, the short answer is no. The reason is that, um, well, we used to have previous study that investigating such number and most of the subject just, and just reply with, oh, I own start, I have the, the license in my, in my high school. So this is just how this, you know, I'm 70 years old. So like yeah. I own this license for 50, yeah. 50 years. And that's how they, but they couldn't quantify how much, you know, they've been educated or like a, what their skill looks like. So we kind of like, um, so after that, we prefer to use like their, how many, you know, their exposure is on the road, how many hours they drive on the road, how many hours their bike. Okay. It's like a problem in Asian though, to administer after all of the drivers, but you know, you know, all the state have a standard driving test and gear code and, and do some kind of correlation down there that that you can really tell. Yeah. Cause there's so many ride shares in, where people pick up cars. And they don't drive or anything. So then when they're on the road, sometimes they're like, especially like coming from a place like the Bay Area where folks are usually Uber and Lyft, and then we'll get a car share. And they don't ride very often. But now they're on the road with a cyclist and they, they have lots of factors, right? But they're not they're not as agile. So that's yeah. that's the kind of new factor in right. kind of far free. But then go pick up a car and then here they are on the road with the cyclists and you know, or they're, they're, they're not as like somebody who's probably not 70, that's 60 age credit is probably better with hearing with the cyclist mm -hmm. than somebody who's younger, who doesn't drive as much and doesn't have that yeah. experience. Yeah. And that's a good point. Yeah. I totally agree with that. And that's just, yeah, unfortunately we don't have, we don't collect that in this study. And by the way, I think I, I agree that's, um, we can definitely consider that their follower. So this is kind of, uh, there's a flow chart of how we analyze the data for, um, we have the after, as I said, we have their scenarios data and post-test data. So, but when in the presentation today, we'll focus more on how we analyze, 
the result for the after scenario. But and for the post test, I'll share with you the summary and how that can be correspond back to the result we have from the first analysis. So as you remember, you may you may remember like we have six or seven questions, you know, after each scenario. So um, first, we we try to do. Um, conduct a factor analysis to see if we can reduce the number of that to be the more aggregated number um, to risk, you know, um, that present the driver's um, assess the the driver and bicyclist assessment. So um, here, like this is like an overview from the data we collected. So you know, each plot shows kind of like a number from the questions we. So overall, bicyclists were less satisfied when they were taking. You know, if you see the first row, well, actually these three are all related to the satisfaction. And again, that's, well, you see those, you know, from the box spots and the mean and, you know, and the variation, overall it's like they're just less satisfied, even with the same scenario. So there must be some something hiding here that's to reduce the bicyclist's satisfaction. We don't know that we don't. The next set of questions is about how they perceive the collision risk. And, you know, and overall, bicyclists perceive the higher risk of collision than the driver, even with the same scenarios. So again, to as we see from the satisfaction, there are some factors that raise their perception. So um, this is the result of, you know, the result of a factor analysis. For the six questions for the driver and the seven questions for the bicyclists, we try to aggregate them into different groups. So based on the um, the factor analysis using the Verimax uh, rotation that we just provide uh, some the evidence that we can, you know, for the driver, the first, first three questions will be aggregated together and the questions four and five will be another set and the question six will be um, alone. And the same strategy will be applied to the bike. So in the next page, after the aggregation, we try to describe each factor like for the driver, um, we well we we can separate those you know aggregate those uh, questions into three factors: satisfaction, perceived collision risk to with the bicyclist, um, or the per perceived risk with the vehicle, and also the perceived collision risk with the oncoming traffic. So kind of like these three. Um, factors are what we're looking at in the data in the data analysis. So before we start looking at those three factors using, you know, like um, to associate those factors to the um, subjective assessment, let's first look at if drivers um, if subjects experience have an impact to their ratings. We try to um, analyze with the association uh, matrix. We just like uh, what number is a bit, a bit uh, the font, is, font size is a bit small right now, but I mean, there is just very low correlation as you can see from the color, just like a pink one for both, you know, for the highest correlation cases. Um, but as we can tell, like the driving mileage per week um, or like a biking, how many hours they bike per week has very like a low correlation to um, their subjective ratings on those three factors. So we will focus on the other factors that we manipulated in this study. Then um, you don't need to look at those numbers on the top. I've already summarized the result for you. So. For the, the first factor about the satisfaction with the overtaking performance, if after the um, the mixed linear model regression we ran, if for, for the higher satisfaction of this overtaking, 
from the driver's perspective is that if there is no incoming traffic for sure and if there is a de dedicated bike lane so for this these two factors um they're consistent between the drivers and bicyclists but there are two other factors the bicyclists care about but not from the driver which are the lateral offset and the uh and then the speed of the vehicle so the bicyclists if if we need like if we're going to increase the satisfaction of the overtaking, the bicyclists will expect the driver, well, the vehicle should remain with a larger lateral offset with them and the slower speed of this overtaking. So the speed in which you're getting three foot loss, um, is he, is that you're not on what, it, what, how many feet should it be? So it's not a dot. Well, should. And, and also on the speed, uh, but the bicycle lets the bottom the average will allow now. Well, what what speed as a driver you want to hold the peak in the ad so that they are most on? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Yeah, although I know that the data done. Right. Yeah. So, well, the question is um, like from. Uh, after the analysis of the like a three feet uh, rule in Michigan is good enough or like any other, how we can make this, um, you know, the bicyclist and driver more satisfied to this um, that we're taking. So I don't have the magic number for that. You know, how far the vehicle should stay, like the, how, how much room it should stay away from the bike. And here are just that, you know, if you remember the design of experiments, um, like the shortest um, lateral offsets from the bike is actually beyond, it's, they're all beyond the three feet. They're like one point, you know, or 1.6, even to two meters. Yeah. And it's from the center of the lake. So the bike is actually like is some distance. Still yeah, they still don't feel comfortable when being overtaken. So. If you want to answer that question, well, three feet is not not enough, and I don't. But I don't have that magic number to say how much is good enough at this point. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, but the driver will not be happy about that. Yeah. Yes. Can you remind me in your simulation was the car autonomous vehicle or was there a driver in the car? The question, well, in, um, the question is, are the vehicles in the simulation, um, are the automated vehicles or, or just manually driven? They're automated vehicles. So we kind of like, uh, so, well, technically those are kind of like a video, you know, scenarios played in videos to them. So actually the participant did not need to do anything. They just stay stationary in the cab or on the bike. And they were just experienced that scenario. That's, that's why we applied that into automated, you know, overtaking. So they don't need to drive or. Oh, okay. So their data set on the driver is really out of hassle and they're innovating. Correct. Got it. On my question, why the number of observations on driver and bike bullets? I thought in your, like, uh, sit, like, you know, chats and said that every driver, they will personally go to. The driver scenarios and goes with the bicycle. So, yeah. So, um, that's part of well. I think that's part of the, the reason that's you know um, you go back well like in our when we recruited the subjects we asked about their experience. Well, they have to own their valid driver's license, but it's kind of difficult for us to ask. Um, since there is no driver's license, there is no license for the bicyclist. Anybody can ride a bike. So those are, we, we excluded some, uh, I think some numbers that's some of the drivers, they, well, some of the, the participants, they rarely bike or they never bike. Yeah. We, we accidentally, uh, well, we inadvertently recruited those participants, but we just, we use their data, but we try to reduce the, you know, bias from that.
And um, so, and the next factor is about how they perceive it, um, the collision risk with the vehicle. So the same for if we want to lower the collision risk from both perspectives, um, we need to, both of them, you know, that's with the, from driver's perspective, um, that's straightforward with the oncoming traffic. Um, well, sorry, from the bicyclist perspective, without oncoming traffic and with dedicated bike lane, we'll reduce the collision of risk. But interestingly, we did not find the same thing from the driver's perspective. They thought when there was an oncoming traffic, the lower collision risk to the bike was actually there. And our explanation was that um, with an incoming traffic, the drivers may drive faster than to complete that overtaking task. They want to finish that as soon as they can to avoid the collision with the with the um, the oncoming traffic. But on the, on the other hand, they may drive faster. So that's kind of a conflict. They may drive faster, but the bicyclists want them to drive slower. To remain, you know, make sure they perceive the um, the lower collision of risk. So that's just something interesting we found that, you know, drivers and bicyclists they perceive the the risk of collision from the different ways, and there's almost like a conflict between. But and it looks like the reason why we're allowing that they either drive or fuel or really call collision. Yeah, so I, well, our explanation was that I think that's interesting to us too. And we tried to, but we did not ask, you know, and the, ask them why they answered that way. But I mean, that's kind of like a statistics. And our, our explanation was that for, with the oncoming traffic, you know, since um, the driver will like to complete that overtaking task as soon as they can. So they will, you know, they may drive fast. Well, they may drive faster, but um, you know they will try to finish that overtaking to be you know complete that overtaking in a shorter time. So let me think. Okay, with a shorter time, that's um, to reduce the collision, the risk of you know collision to the bike. But that may re that may increase the risk of collision to the oncoming traffic, mm -hmm. and that's what we um, see in the next slide. Yes, but, uh, you might wrote it within the distance by a lot. Then the uh, then by well, the condition, the instead of the any light, the day night, by the call, the day Um, no. So the question is, in this study, do we consider the like ambient light or the other environmental factors? And um, no, we just consider it like in daylight. And um, so we only manipulate the road, well, the, the road design, the traffic, and the vehicle maneuver. So this is about the perceived collision risk with the vehicle. And then the next factor is about Proceed the collision risk with oncoming traffic. So, this um, very interestingly is that, or from the driver's perspective, they don't care at all. They don't think any of the, you know, any of factors will change their, um, will have an impact to their perceived risk to the oncoming traffic. Maybe the reason is that in our scenarios, we don't, we did not really create a very risky situations like a, like a short, you know, um, near misses to the oncoming traffic. So they don't feel that's urgent that we need to, or like a much difference for the um, perceived clean risk of collision. But for the bikes, that's interesting since usually in our, well, you know, we may think that very straightforward. Well, the bike is stayed on the right of the road. Why do they need to care about the oncoming traffic? Usually, for most of the cases, I should not run into that or they should not run into me. There is a car in between. And so, but that's, we, we asked this question to the, some, some of the participants that why they care about um, the, the collision to the oncoming traffic. 
And the answer is, they thought there might be the collision between the oncoming traffic and the vehicle just overtake them. And after that, they may be, you know, involved in the crash. So if there is something, you know, they observe from the scenarios, they will care about the collision, not directly with the oncoming traffic, but the crash, you know, led by the, were resulted, resulted by the oncoming traffic. So here, the uh, significant factor we found from the bicyclist per perspective was that if there is no, well, that, that's a, well, if there is no dedicated bike lanes, um, the driver, you know, if there is no dedicated bike lanes, they will um, receive lower risk. So that's an interesting result for us as well. Since we thought if there is a dedicated bike lane, they should reserve, they, they should preserve, perceive the lower risk with the oncoming traffic. Why not? Why it's not like that? So remember, this is after we, you know, we, we, um, as them, we request their feedback on their answers on, you know, on uh, this collision with the oncoming traffic. They care about the collision between the oncoming traffic and the vehicle itself. So with dedicated bike lanes, drivers, you know, they may overtake more carefully and they will like, um, you know, those will, might be less, um, collisions with between the with between the oncoming traffic and the vehicle just overtake them so they feel like that they perceive the la the lower collision risk with the oncoming traffic says so that's kind of like a, you know it could be like a guess since i i try to interpret that way and but again we did not we couldn't read their minds that just how the data shows us but again like um that's very but interesting thing is that they care for the, the design of the bike lanes, um, bicyclists cares, but not from the driver's perspective. And also one other thing we found was that, um, from their demographic data and the ride at biking experience on road, if they exposed more, you know, bike more in the rural areas, they were perceived a higher risk than those who bike more in the urban area. So, but that's this, the perce per perceived risk to the oncoming traffic. So the bicyclists might experience more issues from the oncoming traffic in the rural area. Um, so in summary, this kind of like a provided overview of, you know, the three factors we look at. So basically, you know, if like you, we want to compare the perspectives from the driver and the bicyclist um, for the satisfaction, lower satisfaction. Um, well, if there is some coming traffic and there, if there is no bike lane, they, that will lead to lower satisfaction. And, but that network, that applies for both the, the driver and bicyclist. But for the bicyclist, they also care about the lateral offsets and the speed of the vehicle. It's not, which, which are not applied to the drivers. So those are, those are like a two very critical one if we want, you know, for the automated um, overtaking features. And uh, for the perceived risk of collision um, between, the, between the vehicle and the bike, like um, there's, if there is some common traffic, like um, the collision risk was higher, but like um, also from the bicyclist, they care about uh, the vehicle speed as well. The faster the vehicle drive, that will lead them to the um, to perceive the higher risk of collision with that. And for the post task, um, we try to. This is a summary of the post task, and that shows like to see if we can validate our our findings. Um, for the, for, from the, the after scenario results. So for the, um, the post has, we asked about, do they care about the um, oncoming traffic and the bike lane and the speed and for the, um, the oncoming traffic, yes, they do. 
And for the bike lane, the dedicated bike lanes were presents or not, yes, they do consider. So those are kind of like are consistent to their after scenario questions. And, um, but they're like, a, the other three, like the speed was not, um, you know, some like, like a bicycle, is, they care about the speed, but in their post has, um, they, it's actually not. And then just, we got to connect that to the, their, you know, um, their driving, their behavior scores. And we just found that like for their lower aggressive drivers, uh, they will usually they, um, report the lower collision risks. So like a quick conclusion we found, um, I try to list them and so, but I don't need to walk through them afterwards and bicyclists are satisfied because they do to like the, the other two factors that the drivers, that the drivers did not care. And the dedicated bike lanes work for both parties and, um, Bicyclists cares about the speed that can increase their perceptions on the um, collision risk, but that's not applied. That result was not applied to the drivers. So maybe as a driver, we did not, you know, we're not that aware of how fast we're driving, but that matters to the, the bicyclist. Um, the oncoming, like uh, if they're riding in the dedicated bike lanes, they will receive some uh, risk of collision with oncoming traffic um, in the, and that's an interesting finding that we did not see from our um, assumptions before. And like uh, their experience or exposures in the rural or urban areas matter. And also the last one was kind of like a comment from myself, like when developing those features, um, please consider all the stakeholders. Since if you just do that from a single perspective, you'll miss a lot of things. Okay. So like in the future, yeah, we try to extend that. Yeah. That's San Francisco. So, um, in the future we try, since we have in this study, we have already identified the critical factors about, um, their positive and negative, uh, effects to the subjective assessments. And then, but as, um, the question we just answered a few minutes ago, that's, we don't, we don't have the magic number yet to see, you know, what's the comfort zone for the, both, for both the drivers and bicyclists. We know those factors matter. We know those factors associated with, um, their, their subjective and their subjective assessment and the perceptions. But we don't know how much we need to adjust on that. So that's kind of like a second, um, the follow on study. And the best case was, is that if we can do that on test track or on road, since in the simulator, sometimes let's, it's still the virtual reality world. So if you like to discuss, you know, on um, the true distance or the lateral gap or longitudinal gap, you like to make sure in the comfort zone, the better ways to do that. Um, in the real world. Curtis, anything? Yeah. 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 So thank you. That concludes my presentation today and appreciate, um, CCAT and CSRC to, um, provide the financial support and CSRC for the, uh, tech, for the consultant technical support. And then thank you so much. Um, this my contact and my um, co-PI Shambao's contact, feel free to pass any question to us. We're happy to um, answer the questions and we're open for any discussions for the opportunities in the future. Thank you. Yes. So if it's fully possible with these variables that there is no local optimum that the optimum is down in the city somewhere, right? That a biker is continually more comfortable the further the car gets away from them. But at the speed question, I imagine if you pass a bike that's going 10 miles an hour and you pass them 12 miles an hour, they'll feel less comfortable by just having this car next to them the whole time. 
So right. I imagine there will be a local option for the speed question. But I, I'm guessing actually the distance question nature. Maybe it'll actually get to some point, you know, at 10 feet away, they're oblivious to the difference between 10 versus 12 versus whatever. You know, yeah. Maybe there's a point where it actually just bottoms out. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so I feel like the, the, the distance, you, you can't really use a satisfaction as a criteria. You have to use safety data. Um, I, I think the natural mixed driving data doesn't really have any actual effect, right? No. So, so when you build a model, um, you are not considering the actual safety as a factor. And I mean, you could imagine that all the all the conditions that you're testing are all safe. Right. I'm not happy about it. Doesn't mean that I'm not safe. I think mm -hmm. there, there are something that has to be considered beyond what the metric. Don't get me wrong, this is a good yeah. study. But yeah, well, it looks like safety is something that is not 100% considered here, and we, we have to have to really evaluate the actual pressure. What right. happens, right? So, mm -hmm. so I would ride a bike in a car passively. What I'm afraid of is my bike might slip on some rocks, exactly. and, and exactly. I will fall in front of the car, right? Yeah. And that analysis you could actually do, you know, how based on physics, if this if this button does all of a sudden go out of control, where might it end up? And and therefore where does the car have to be? There's no chance that it'll actually get that person. Yeah, could actually yeah if, if the car playing uh, as well and the, the rider is acting in the there's no way that the person may have a crash. Yeah. There was something happened. Due to some trigger, I mean, speed could be one of the problems. You, you suddenly have a big win. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, you suddenly got surprised and things like that. I, I think those are safety issues that is, I think, we will have to consider that. Right? right. Yeah. I mean, like, uh, since that's also like a constraint in the simulator, we couldn't simulate that, you know, in the as the real world. So it's kind of like, um, for the follow-on, but I agree, like safety is a big issue. And like we try to explain some of the interpret some of that from the perception to the collision, like a you know, perception of risk of collision in this study. But again, we did not really include any crashes. Um you said the future is San Francisco, and I come from San Francisco <laughs> too. Well, that's just an example. I did not focus. I, I, <laughs> that's not personal on San Francisco. <laughs> There's a lot of data. From we have the cars on the, the the autonomous vehicles are already on the street. We've got what? the crash data. What? Yeah, we have we, we have a lot of crash data. We have a lot of inter interactions with bicycles. But do you have that data from you know from Cruz and and Waymo um, on and and Zooks on where that actual data is now with the with the cars on the the road? Oh, uh, the question is, do we have the the data from um the other like a Automate, automated vehicle makers. Um, because we now have millions of miles traveled. Right. We have thousands, hundreds of thousands of passenger rides. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we don't. And I don't, I suspect anybody has that. And um, I, well, I love like some of the, in California, they have California DMV, they have the reports on the crashes from the automated, automated vehicles. But those are kind of like uh, when they test those automated vehicles any crashes occurred. And that could be like crashes between with the bicyclists or scooter riders. And yeah. so the data is separated. Um, the crash data, we have a lot. And that's what you're starting to data. We felt like we had a lot, but it's not enough. The in average one million mile driven actually calls one fatality. Yeah. How, how many million miles we, we have in that we strive? We don't. We, we have a few cases. Mm -hmm. That is probably we can see everything, but but not the whole story. Mm -hmm. And then you have to link the crash data with the natural risk driving data. How you link it? I think that that would be my <laughs> Oh yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and hopefully, I can find some financial support to do that. Yeah, that'll be good. Well, I'm sure that happens. Did you see any in like Japan or Taiwan or China any similar simulation models or data and then do kind of like a compare contrast to see what those results were there to inform the research or recommendations? So the question is, do we 
is there any LIGA data from different countries that can support such LIGA similar study or models we had here? Um, I mostly, I mean, for the automated lane change features, we see a lot of like from the industry, but they have their own. Mm -hmm. So um, I really see like uh, specifically on, um, you know, how we should suggest what the automated vehicles should do. Like, but I believe that's different. Um, that'll be about different by countries. And well, I believe China will have a lot of data about that. Japan, I don't know. Taiwan, where I'm from, but I don't believe they have. So, yeah. But I'm looking forward to that if, like, it, there isn't. So it's like many, that's very different. Since, like, um, China, there are a lot of bikes. Like, and they, they ride bikes to different, um, you know, different intentions as in probably not for recreation, but to me, to commute more often than in the U.S. So yeah, that'll be like a big issue. So come and I see some questions online, but I couldn't see them. Um, first one was how do you define aggressive drivers is that self recording? So, um, we did not really classify their, uh, for the aggressive driver, we did not really classify them as aggressive driver, but we just, based on the scores, you know, um, behavior scores we collected. So it just more like the higher scores that will, um, have an impact The well, the participants with the higher scores, which means they could be more aggressive and they have different perceptions perceptions on the risk of collisions to the others. Uh, it looks like the experimental design, the two levels of lateral offsets, two versus 1.8 meters are quite similar. Do you think the subjects were able to notice the difference from the vice versa perspective of the simulator? That's a good question. As I, I remember I mentioned about that some could, some just couldn't, especially, um, when you serve serve from the driver's perspective so that's why drivers estimates from driver's perspective to estimate the lateral offsets as kind of like as in the literature review they drivers um they usually overestimate they thought they have like three meters actually they have only 1.5 but that for the bicyclists, um, in our study, they did most of the bicycle and they can tell the difference. But especially they see how much the vehicle crossed the lane boundary.